cloud. All right. Got it. All right. Okay. Um, well, if you're here tonight, you obviously saw the announcement about Bruce Dale. So you know a little bit. Um, Bruce was a um, photographer with National Geographic for over 30 years. I am not going to take up a lot of his time um, talking about all the things that he has done, but uh, he is one of the leading photographers of our time. And he, we're very, very lucky to have him. Um, he's traveled the world on assignments for Nat Geo, one of the first Western photographers to visit China. And he's returned there at least a dozen times and worked in his bio says over 80 other countries. So we're gonna go with that, Bruce. <laughs> but for 30 years, he worked for Nat Geo. And um, I hope that's enough of an introduction. I will let you take it from there. Thank you very much, Bruce, for being here. And you need to unmute yourself, Bruce. Because everybody else is muted. So we don't have people talking over you. It's down at the bottom, usually on the left. Uh-oh. Roberta, can you unmute Bruce? I'm trying to do it now. <laughs> and no, I can't. He can. Bruce? No, we Bruce, can't hear you. We still can't hear now? you. Now? How can you hear me Yes. Now? Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, let me back up here a little bit here. I started by saying that it's good to be back in Ohio, <laughs> although I'm sorry it's being, it's virtual. You know, the, Ohio is where I got my start in photography uh, many years ago. And uh, wait a second here, play. Do you have anything there now? Yes, we, we have, have a picture on the screen. Do you see? Yeah, a... we can see it. Okay. it can, we can see it. It's perfect. Okay, good. So, as a as a staff photographer for National Geographic, as you say, uh, as you mentioned, I worked in over eighty countries and uh, and uh, traveled to China before many visitors got, got even to visit, and uh, traveled overland in, in a Volkswagen camper with gypsies from from England to India. But I'm not sure any of those travels were more exciting than my very first out of town overnight assignment when I worked on the Toledo Blade. And that was to go to Columbus, Ohio <laughs> to photograph the annual Ohio State Michigan football game. That was a, <laughs> that was a big deal. <laughs> and it just shows how relative everything is. But I was very lucky. I, I was actually paid to, to scuba dive in the Bahamas with Peter Benchley and I traveled across China by railroad with the adventure writer, Paul Thoreau, where we dined on bear paw, moose nose and cobra soup. And I once slept with frozen wolves in Alaska and was chased by an alligator in the Okafinoki and cornered by a five foot diamond rattlesnake and had a back massage by a 200 pound bear, which I'll show you later on. And where else could you work? And meet Jonah, Gina Lola Brigida at a crucifixion in the Philippines or the world's richest woman at a mud bath in California. You know, I got started very early in my photography in Lakewood, Ohio, and had about 50 pictures published in the Cleveland newspapers before I graduated from high school. Some were featured pictures of, of uh, whoops, something's not, this is not, I'm sorry about that, it's not advancing. Can you hear me? Can people hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, now you heard me say it's not advancing. Yes, I heard you say that. All right, I'm gonna try escaping from this thing. What's going on here? All right, so uh, here we, I think it's working now. So um, I was saying that I had 50 pictures published in the Cleveland papers before I graduated from high school. Most of them pictures like this in the sports pages uh, or chasing ambulances and fire engines and uh, feature pictures like this rail, this train and steam engine in downtown Cleveland. And this is the kind of picture I wish I had made more of. And uh, uh, the steam engine probably has a, has a little bit to do with my, uh, my 
getting into photography because several years earlier I got arrested riding boxcars on one of these trains in Cleveland, the Cleveland area. And, uh, and after going to court, my parents were very relieved, I think, that I, my, I got a new hobby of photography. Um, but the, the arrest actually was kind of interesting. It wasn't, uh, I was with, with interesting people. I was with Bobby Begin, uh, one of my buddies, and uh, he was the nephew of the Bishop of Cleveland at the time, and, uh, and later became a, a lawyer and a, and a priest, and he was known as the activist priest. And he was the one that broke into the Dow Chemical offices in in Cleveland, Ohio, protesting the, pro, the, the napalm and, and Agent Orange. So I never got arrested again, but my buddy Bobby began, became a priest and got arrested often. Um, after high school, I went to work at Cleveland Clinic uh, for about a year, and, uh, and this is a self-portrait at the clinic. And um, then he went to work at the Toledo Blade, where I stayed, stayed seven years shooting pictures like this. Uh, it was a gas truck that rolled over and exploded in, in Cleveland. And play, photographing places like this. And one of the things I know that I've learned, I'm learning more and more, is that pictures have a life of their own and things you come back later on to become more and more important. Like this picture here of me shows the, the, the racetrack, which is still called a brickyard, I think, but it was a brickyard back then. You can see the, the bricks in the, in the home stretch in the background. And another picture I made at the time, which was interesting, but nothing super special, but they, they were allowed to build these grandstands around the, the track and they were just deadly things. And I guess I climbed up on one of them to photograph these kids erecting the one nearby. And the following year, um, the, 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 one of the stands collapsed. And this is not my picture, but um, there were several people killed and uh, 80 injured, I believe. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that's a site you will never see again. You, you wind up photographing things that, that no longer, you don't realize at the time, but they're you're really documenting humanity. This is a Paris where I visited eight times before I ever got across the country to, our, to California. And um, I, was, I was lucky. I spent 30 years on the staff of the Geographic between 64 and 94 during a time when the circulation grew from 3 million to over 10 million. And some people called it the golden years, but, but I, I would better describe them as platinum. Money or time was no object. I worked with a great team of editors and researchers and writers. We had the best of equipment. And if you couldn't buy it, we had a machine shop ready to design and build it. We had the finest photographic lab in the world you might think it made my job easier, but actually presented much more pressure because there were there were never an, uh, there was never an excuse not to get a picture. Now this is the kind of assignments we got back in the early days. It says, Bruce, please shoot Mona Lisa in Paris, two thirty p.m. Tuesday next. Today, photographers have a twenty-page contract they have to sign, which has to be submitted through quite a few levels and then you have to show indemnity insurance and you have to have a proposal and other expenses. There's my, that was a picture that I shot of Mona Lisa at the time. Another one of Venus. Of course, the, the name National Geographic, Geographic opened a lot of doors. I remember arriving in a small Delaware town late one evening to see a sign on the door that said, welcome Bruce Dale, National Geographic Magazine. And I thought, wow, that's nice. I wonder if they left flowers or, or candy. And I went up to the desk and presented myself and they said, I'm sorry, we're full. And I said, but wait a minute, that's my name on the marquee. And he, he said, I don't know who put that up there. So eventually they found me a room in a maid's closet. Also in Paris, this is uh, Baron de la Rede, who was, uh, was known as the best host in all of Europe. And he threw these incredible parties. Uh, the social elite of the world came. They, it was, I was, I was invited, the only, in fact, I was the only photographer there. And I, I was invited, provided I wear, of course, a tuxedo and, and one camera, a black Nikon, one lens, no flash. He had, they, they, had, they had three orchestras playing from, from night until dawn. They had, they had half naked men dressed as Nubian slaves bearing torches. Everything was candlelit. There was nothing with electricity. And the social elite of the world was there. People like 
Salvador Dali, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Yves Saint Laurent, Bridget Bardot, Rudolf Nureyev, Maria Callas, Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, and on. I, I, wish I, I wish I had identified these people at the time. In 2007, an Arab prince from Qatar bought, bought his place for $88 million. And the preservationists were alarmed when they learned the new owner planned to install underground parking and elevators. But after years of legal battling, they, they got the go ahead. But in July of 2013, a major fire caused serious damage to, to all of the rooms. Restoration is finished now. And I'm sure there'll be other parties there and, and a photographer that will be there to, to photograph them, but it won't be like the one I that I was visited. Mine was like walking into a Renaissance painting. Also in Paris, this guy's, this is the kind of picture I love getting, the picture that makes you smile. That's not contrived. This, this guy's parking his car. He just towed it in and no, nosed it in and picked up the back and bounced it in. Pictures, th this is a, this, these are my, photo, my, my film boxes back then. Uh, we used to have to uh, stamp our initials on the pictures after we viewed them, after we reviewed them. And I did that until one year, somebody came to me and said they were throwing out boxes of pictures and they opened them up and they didn't look that bad and do I really want to throw them out? So that's when I stopped using my initials on my Bruce Albert Dale on my, on my film. Traveling a lot was difficult over the years. I was going eight, nine months out of the year. I took one of the ways I solved it with my family. I, my boys, I took my boys with me one at a time on various trips. This is Christopher and out in the Stahican area. We had that, that plane had just picked, that seaplane had pulled up to, to pick us up, to take us back to a village. And, and Chris was saying, Daddy, Daddy, there's a boat coming over here and it's got wings. And, and this is Jeff with me in, the, in England and the gypsy caravan. And here's Greg and I in Alaska. This is, uh, uh, Bunt Howard uh, with his, uh, with his uh, using a, what they call a bull tongue plow uh, on, the, on the side of a hill. Bunt was also famous for making uh, little uh, oak baskets, beautiful oak baskets. And I bought one and uh, I wanted, when I'm on the way back to Washington, I had nothing big enough to put it in. So I decided to put my cameras in it. So I wrapped my cameras in the you know, blue tablecloth and put them in the book, this oak basket. And, and I had bib over I was like, like, oh, when I, just like um, Bund is wearing there. And I got on the plane and I was sitting next to a woman uh, from England. She had a just very distinguished, distinguished British voice and her nose kind of went up in the air and she just kind of leaned away from me. And as we flew into Washington, I realized that I was going to England to photograph a a gypsy horse trading festival up in Appleby, England. And so I asked her, I said, are you British? And she said, yes, yes, why do you ask? And I said, well, do you know where Appleby, England is? And she said, yes, I do, of course. Um, why do you ask? And I said, because I'm going over there. She said, and she then for the first time, she really turned and looked at me and she said, you, you're going to Appleby? What in the world for? And so at that point I was a little bit pissed. So I said to her, well, I heard they have some really good horses. I'm going over there to buy horses. And uh, so she was then, she kept you know, drilling me, trying to find out more about me. Of course, I didn't tell her anything else. <laughs> this is, uh, these are the Denton, the Denton family. And uh, they're a family of wood carvers. Ivan is the only, they live in a really remote part of Arkansas. And Ivan, when I, on my first trip there, he was the only one in, in all of my years at the Geographic that asked me to prove that I was with the Geographic. I think maybe he was suspicious of me over his girls. But anyways, uh, Terry Denton, uh, at, on one day, uh, Ivan said, why don't we uh, go down into the, to the creek and, um, and, and uh, cool off? And so we went down to the creek and, and Terry's in this creek here. And on that, that day, I had flown out there on, um, on Ozark Airlines and the stewardesses had passed out jelly donuts. And, uh, and I commented how good they were. And on the way off the, off the aircraft, the stewardess handed me extra jelly donut, when, which I put in my camera case. And then when I got near Denton's house, I needed that camera case. So I took it out and I exchanged it. Uh, one of the lenses in that aluminum Halliburton case for the jelly donut. I took a 500 millimeter mirror lens out of there, which I think is what I made this picture with. And uh, anyways, um, so Terry's in the water here and I'm taking these pictures and she says, who you got in that aluminum case over there? 
And I said, well, those are my jelly donuts. And she said, oh, come on, you aren't, you don't know, you come on, what's in there? And I said, no, they're jelly donuts, do you want one? And I opened up this aluminum Halliburton case and pulled out a jelly donut. And I never went back there again after that and without jelly donuts. This is a Bill, this is the Carroll family, Bill Carroll. Uh, I photographed, I took this picture on a day that he, he had just come back from working in the coal mines. His father had, had black lung and I'm sure Bill came on down with it also. This, this is in Cabin Creek, West Virginia. These are coal miners, so strip miners in Kentucky. This is a place called Sillimore Creek in Arkansas. And I am sure these boys and their families have been swimming here for, for generations. But I went back there a couple of years later and there were great big, there were signs everywhere saying no swimming. And the area had been bought by some outfit that turned it into a campground and had no, and had no trespassing, you no know, swimming signs everywhere. And, and they'd put in electrical outlets for campers that did not quite want to get away from it all. Dexter Callahan. Dexter was a, a candy salesman during the week and a, and a preacher, a snake handling preacher on the weekend. It was a rattlesnake. He'd gotten bit several times. In fact, I was sitting one of the, one of the days I attended the services. I sat next to a guy that his arm was swollen and as blue as my denim shirt. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, snake bit me. And I said, well, what are you going to do for it? He said, nothing, the Lord will cure. This is a, a sheriff coward and his deputy with their sawed off shotgun. I was at that picture. You can just see the corner of a concrete bridge, which is overlooking the creek. We don't have those pictures in here, but there, were, there was a baptizing in the creek there. And I was taking pictures from above here. And he saw me and he stopped and he said, yeah, you, this is dangerous standing on this bridge. I'm going to stop and I'm going to protect you. And he stood there and, he, and um, he just kind of guarded the bridge while I took pictures. and. And later he says to me, he says, you know, uh, we ain't got no trouble with teenagers around here. I kick the shit out of them. And they don't tell either, otherwise I'll tell on them. <laughs> oh, and this is, a, the, this is something that, that's happening more and more lately. It's, a, it's that pictures, of, have they come back after all these years? This little girl wrote to me, this was taken over 50 years ago. And she wrote to me recently and she said, I am the little girl you photographed and labeled shy eyes. And also on the horse behind my grandfather, that's her riding on the back of her grandfather's horse underneath the oh, what was that, a redwood, redbud tree. And uh, her father, her grandfather was the, was the uh, post, a postman in, in Pippa Passes. He was the last postman to deliver mail by horse back. Here he is delivering a, a record of the month to this family. He told me, I, I had to draw the line, he says. I, I, I no longer deliver mail order tires. <laughs> if you look carefully on this, on this mailbox, you can see a Prince Albert can used as the sign for lifting up. She also wrote to me in that letter, she said, Neely Road, I'm gonna quote from her, Neely Road is now blacktop and no longer the muddy road we had to walk. I go over there sometimes, not very often. Life has changed here, some for the better and some for worse. The drugs have taken a lot of the kids here to their graves and others are just getting by. God has blessed my family and I am thankful for his mercies. Linny Hall. And Linny is on my list of people to visit. The COVID has prevented that, but I wanna go back and photograph her on this road. I had no idea when I shot this picture that how important it would be later. In fact, I don't even think we published it. I drove past these men near, uh, near Harlan, Harman, Harlan County, Kentucky in a pretty rough area. And uh, I drove by them and I looked over them and I thought to myself, well, I know, you know first of all, the scenes from the deliverance, that movie went through my mind and then, uh, I knew I'd heard of three photographers that had been shot at in that county. And I kept on driving and I think I went maybe another 10 miles, five miles and, I, and it was raining even. And I was late for, to meet a, a moonshiner. 
but I turned around and went back. And I thought, gosh, I can't pass those guys. I went back and I grabbed a copy of National Geographic and I read one camera and I walked up the road and they broke out in smiles and they yelled, hi there, come on up, have a beer. <laughs> and uh, and I photographed them and I, they said, well, we're all dirty. And I said, well, if we publish it, we'll, we'll say you're working in your cars. I got in an argument with the Geographic and I won. They wanted to put the editor of that at the time lived in that area and he was ashamed, uh, ashamed by, the, by the dirt on the ground and he had put grass in there and they had tried to have the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the people that do the engravings put grass on the ground and I, 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 got, I got mad and said no. Anyways, I went back here 20 years later looking for these boys and, uh, and I, I saw this, I found a little kid at the post office and he, he looked at the photograph and he said, yeah, them's my uncles. Uh, he said, they's all doing great. He said, they's, got, they's, they's all married and they, they's drive. He looked at my car and he said, they's driving a better car than you got. <laughs> Looking very disapprovingly at mine. And uh, I didn't follow up on them, but I went back again about, oh, this is eight or nine years ago and looked for them. The house was gone. I found their mother and she said, yeah, them is my boys. That one's dead. That one's almost dead. She says, yeah, that house burnt down and they built another one. It burnt down too. And she said, they were born in a cabin there and then, and then had a bunch more born down the road. This is a this is in Dominica, Commonwealth of Dominica. It's a view of the main city you know, from the water. I rented a small boat out to go out and get an establishing picture. And, and uh, one day at, while I was photographing a market, these two rough looking guys went up and started hassling some girls selling some vegetables. And I took a picture of them with a telephoto lens a couple blocks away. And, and uh, they, but they turned and saw me and they hit immediately storms right straight towards me. And I kind of, I backpedaled and I cut between some cars and they split up and they, <laughs> and they cornered me between two cars. And they said, what's up bud? And uh, I said, well, I was just hoping I could take your picture. And they said, okay, where do you want us? <laughs> so I said, well, that right there is good. Let's try another one across the street. I learned later that one of the guy on the left had just gotten out of prison and he was a bad dude. Sometimes you make pictures and you just, you, you, they, again, they come back later to have more importance. This is a girl I photographed at a um, Halloween party uh, that I attended in Virginia a couple of months, maybe four years ago. She was very friendly and uh, until she learned I was a photographer and then she said, well, you're not so important. And, uh, and um, several years later, I, I saw her picture on the front post of the Washington, front page of the Washington Post and I recognized him. I thought, what the hell was that? And I went back and got these pictures out. It's Maria Butina, the, uh, the Russian spy that got arrested here and convicted of spying and sent back to Russia. Nobody's ever seen these except being published here. And doing a story on the subject of time, I wanted to photograph uh, how some people try to stop time. And I went to this town in California, they're known for its mud baths. And I, I got permission to photograph the mud baths. And the night before I was to take the pictures, I, I was having pizza in this little pizza shop and there were a couple of girls at the next table. And, and I asked them how the pizza was. And they said, oh, here, it's good, share it. So we had pizza together and I said, how would you like to photo be photographed in a mud bath for, for National Geographic? And he said, oh, that's a great idea. So I took the pictures. We went back to, gave, I drove them back. They had taken buses up from, from, um, from what was it, San Francisco. And, um, and, and, they, uh, and so I, I drove them back in my car to San Francisco and we stopped at some wineries. I had a great day and one of her husbands, one of the husbands was way there we had dinner together. And then we, uh, um, I said, let me send you some pictures. And she said, well, I don't give out my, 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 um, my name, <laughs> my, uh, my address. And anyways, it, she, she finally admitted, she said that they don't usually give out their names. Her name is Christy Walton. And she was later became the richest woman in the world. I still keep in touch with her. This is another picture that came back. This is amazing. This, this is taken over 50 years ago uh, in a little island called Saint Pierre, the islands of Saint Pierre and Miquelon. French islands off the coast of Newfoundland. And I made this picture of this, these boats that came in during a severe storm. And, um, and a couple of years ago, this, this man in the foreground, his, his kids wrote to me and, and wanted to get a copy of the print for their, for their father. 
And it's actually a picture that I, I mean, when I took a water, some watercolor classes, I made a watercolor of this. Anyway, so it's special to me. And so she'd written to me and wanted to get a, a copy of the picture in print. Of course, I gave it to her. And, I, and he's, she said he went to school, went to, went to work on the, on, the, on the ships when he was 13. He was so young that they used to lock him up in the cabins during the storms. And he remembered that day. He said he was the only one that would slide, slide down the ropes to tie up the boat. His name was, oh shoot, I can't remember his name. He lives in the, he lives in the Faroe Islands and he invited me to go, to go sailing with him and fishing. He's retired now. And it's, again, one of those things, COVID's slowing down. Uh, the, the, some people ask how, how, where do pictures come from? Where do, who gets, where do, how do your assignments go, come about? And uh, they come out in different ways. And, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of them are, I think I had more than most people. I had 10 assignments that I'd suggested. And I'd suggested a story on, the, on desert adaptations. And while I was photographing this rare fish, I think it was called a desert pupfish in Death Valley, this roadrunner ran by me. And I had an assistant that day and he said, Bruce, there's a roadrunner behind you. And I turned around and I did not see it. And then I looked again and then he sure enough, he went, ran running by me. And so that started this uh, little um, love affair with a roadrunner. And uh, I'm having trouble with this thing. Uh, advancing again, I'm not sure why. I'm gonna do, last time it, I solved this by hitting Command period. Nope, that gave me a beep. Whoops, there we go. Let me go back. Yeah, there we are. Okay, oops, skip one. Yeah, so that roadrunner I photographed, the first one came running, came flying back a little while later with this lizard and almost ran up to me with this lizard. And then he jumped in my, in my truck and stood on the seat with this lizard. And then he dropped it and he took off and he came back a third time, this time with a cigarette in his mouth and he jumped in my van, right in my caliber, hel my Halliburton case. That's the Halliburton case I was talking about earlier. He's standing in this Halliburton case. And so I thought, what the heck's going on? So I, I had, uh, in my notes, I had this woman, uh, Dorothy Whitson, what, who was a, had a doctorate in the courtship behavior of roadrunners. And the nearest phone was about, this is, of course, was way before cell phones. The nearest phone was about 20 miles away. And I knew these people that had a phone, but they couldn't afford to have it back at their ranch. So they buried it in an upside down ore car. And so I was free to use this phone if I wanted to. So here I'm making a phone call to Martha Whitson. And uh, she said that, well, you probably have a bisexual roadrunner that's courting you. And she theorized that the, the, the roadrunner had imprinted on, on somebody and uh, uh, was probably raised by a, by a human being and it lay imprinted on them. So when they came into the heat, they were, they were, they were, they were bringing me presents. And so, that started this 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 whole new uh, little episode. I had this. We had my boat. My boys and I at home were playing with radio controlled tanks, and so I took one and I put a stuffed roadrunner on the top with a tape recorder there, and um, and here and, and here it is with an Olympus camera, and I started. To, I tried to making remote control pictures of animals. I think this may. You know, there, there are a lot of remote cameras out there, but this was done a long time ago. This may be the very first remote control uh, camera of the sort. And so here we have this roadrunner with a tail that will actually wag, wag up or down or left or right, depending on whether one, which one I want to emulate, male or female. And there's a tape recorder in the back that plays a, a call. And I could call a roadrunner up to my roadrunner. And he would come out of the woods and you know, run up right up to my, right up to my, 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 my dummy here. And so I put a, a stick in the dummy, in the mouth of my, my fake doe roadrunner. You can see it here. And, um, and Martha had told me that the courtship behaviors, they like to build, a, they, they, they exchange sticks to build a nest together. It means let's go build a house together. So this wild roadrunner came up and accepts this twig from my stuffed roadrunner. And, uh, and, I'm hiding. You, won't, you don't see me in the background, that green bush there, but I'm, on the, I'm hiding behind that bush over there. And, uh, and uh, my roadrunner that day had a broken tread and it would only go in circles. And the road, this, this wild roadrunner got absolutely furious and started attacking the roadrunner, realizing it was a fake and he jumped up and down. And you can see me in the background there where I've come out of my hiding. 
and they worried about my my decoy being torn to bits and he knocked it to the ground and he started he started beating it up and um, i was so i I, he walked he walked away from it and I played that recording again and he came flying back thinking, no, you're not dead yet. And he started stomping it. So I finally had to break it up. Yeah. So that was a that was that was a that's a well, that was weeks and weeks of work, maybe a month or two total, maybe a month, building everything and but and it was a it's a um, more of what you would call an illustration. Although I did uh, that, that story goes on and on because it had rattlesnakes involved in it too, but I won't get into that. But it was a, um, it, this, is a uh, this is a pure documentary picture. This was one not planned at all. And it wound up running on the cover of the magazine. It was taken in California near Santa Barbara uh, during an oil spill and uh, ran on the cover of the magazine. And went out to 11 million people. And it's, it's, it's said that that was that, that oil spill. And, and I hope that the magazine have contributed to a, a movement to control. In fact, they banned all of the oil offshore drilling at that time. Yeah. And that was one of the beginning of one of the, one of the major environmental movement. Other pictures that I've shot, like this golden frog in, in Panama, you know, these were all over the streams in the, mount, in the mountains of Panama. And now they are on the endangered, they're, they're actually they're, they're extinct in the wild. They're only available, they're only alive in captivity. Also, another type of extinction that probably went on in Panama, I took pictures of this, this island and I have tried since then a couple of times to identify the island to see what happened to it. But with the rising waters, it, it's probably gone now. When I shot that picture, I was shooting from a from a, from a military helicopter, sitting in the door, when the uh, with a stra safety strap in front of me. When uh, this was one of these big Huey helicopters with two two stories, and the pilot and the co-pilot ran in to clear our turbulence, and it took that helicopter and it flung it on its side up in the air, and I was facing straight down, and I could hear the pilot yelling to the co-pilot, "Don't fight it! Don't fight it! Ride through it!" And you know, this is in. Utah, a place called False Panorama Overlook. White Sands, New Mexico. Here on the Arizona Colorado border. This is these are this is these are grass seeds at dawn on a, a river near the uh, uh, near the Yampa River. At the Green River, right just off the Green River. And it's a, it, they, I camped here and I woke up in the morning to, to this grass, these grass seeds were like knee deep and they're just kind of floating there. And it looked to me like an oriental painting. So it's a hole in the wall. It's actually, it's not a Photoshop, it's just a hole in a wall in Utah. This is uh, called uh, Dutton Point. And this is the actual spot where uh, where the, uh, the painting Chasm of the Colorado by Thomas Moran was painted. I did a short trip down the Colorado River uh, with these men. Um, that's Dougal Bremer in the foreground and right behind him is George Mancuso who was my assistant that day. And um, Dougal had a, had a uh, underwater housing that he had homemade out of an ammunition can that happened to, but luckily it was the same can of camera that I had. So he, so he let me borrow it and I sat in the bow of this, this dinghy and uh, there was nothing, I wasn't tied down or held down anyway. And we hit a, we hit a, well, first of all, when I, when I put the camera in there, I, pr I tried the trigger and, and it, it was so dense that I couldn't hear it firing. And I must have wasted two or three frames. And I said, I don't know if it's working. And he said, put your ear, put your ear against it. And I did. And he did wasted three or four more frames. So I made several, several pictures already. And we hit this, uh, this rapid here. I think this is, this is, it's called Horn Creek Rapids. And it, I, it hit, a, it threw me in the air. And I thought I was going in the water and I landed on the gunnel over here on the side. Later thought I had broken my arm. But, and I shot pictures the whole way, but this was the last frame. Dougal was killed in a boating accident later on, and the, my assistant George Mancuso in the middle was also killed on the Colorado River. 
This is that same rapid. And so I was sitting in the bow there, facing back towards the orbit the or when, when we hit that and I went flying through the air. That was dumb. This is uh, also in the Colorado River. This is where the little Colorado joins the Colorado. You can see a, a one person on the shore over there. And if you look real closely at the bottom right corner, there are three men peeing behind a rock. This is also where they've, this is a, a kind of a pretty little spot, but in all of the diaries that I researched for my story on Paul, everybody said this was the nearest place to hell that they'd ever been. It was hot, there were rattlesnakes there and it stunk from the, from the sulfur of the, from the water. And it's also exactly where they found the body of George Mancuso who had been caught in a flash flood in the river. This is from my Powell, John Wesley Powell coverage. It's, it was the only picture I'd hanging in my house for many years. It was, it's, it's bit taken from the bedroom where he died on the coast of Maine. So you know, here a man who spent a lot of his life in the arid Southwest, passed away up on, the, up on the coast of Maine. This is uh, Canyon Lands. Colorado River with uh, Texas in the foreground and Mexico in the background. Another picture that it came it presented me a surprise later on. I got an envelope in the mail one day and I opened it up and inside was a first day of issue stamp with some collect that some collector had sent to me and wanting me to sign it. Uh, unbeknownst to me that National Geographic sold it to the post office and they used it as a stamp. This is kind of an interesting, uh, um, what's the word uh, looking for? The, uh, I'll think of it in a second. This was, I was traveling with, with my wife on the, in Utah and saw this beautiful little grove of trees. And we went down to photograph it, parked the car, walked a quarter mile down to the trees and noticed this little stream here. And she was up in the trees taking pictures and I'm down here at the bottom. And, uh, uh, and I was the, then this, the, the shade started going through it. So I threw a graded filter on there. This, of course, is using film and, and much easier today. And shot this picture here. And then and Joyce was shooting pictures from up on the top, looking in the other direction. And it wasn't until weeks later when we looked at our film that we had these pictures taken at the exact time of the day. And, uh, and um, oh, the exact same trees. I'll back it up here. It's the exact same time of day. This is shot with like a 21 millimeter versus shot with about an 85 looking down there. And it just shows the, uh, how much difference uh, things look from different opinions. Kind of, it's kind of a, has a moral to it. If you, if you ever get an argument with somebody about whatever it is, if you look at it from their perspective, you're gonna see an entirely different picture. This is uh, the uh, painter, uh, uh, oh, the great American painter, oh boy hit me in the head um, uh, from the Southwest, did the, all the stuff in the Missouri State House. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Morton, Thomas Morton. Shoot, I'll think of it. Um, another picture I shot, uh, the time it was taken for, I was working in a Civil War story and this was a swamp. I took this picture, it got, it got selected by, by Carl Sagan to go on board the Voyager spaceship uh, on a, on, on engraved on a gold disc so that millions of years from now or billions of years from now when this planet's gone when our when all of our galleries are gone the Smithsonian and the Metropolitan Museum are gone my picture is still in this permanent gallery floating around in space recently it left the solar system another one of my pictures that kind of make you Smile a little bit. Obviously taken it before they it's fenced off the way it is now. For the story on time, I decided to photograph a, uh, I do a photographic pun of killing time and I photographed uh, bullets going through watches using Harold Edgerton's lab at MIT. And this was an unusual, unusual picture that we, we did not plan on 
but it, it shows this flash as, as the bullet is, is touching this watch. And what it is, is the, uh, we learned, I learned later, is the compression of air molecules as it's, as it's touching the back of this watch. This is my watch collection at the end of the day. For a story on aviation, uh, it had already had uh, 10 photographers that worked on this when the, when the assignment was, I was asked to help out on it. And I decided to try something that hadn't been done before. And I looked at all the different ways to mount cameras on planes. And you could, there were, there were I'd, I'd seen pictures of videos of, of cameras mounted in wheel wells, but that was just a picture of a wheel coming into land. So I, I got into my head that maybe we could put one on the tail of a plane. At first I went to, to, uh, uh, to Boeing and, and they, they said no way that they didn't want any part of that. They said they would fly me alongside the tail in a helicopter while it landed. And I said, no, thank you. And then I went to Lockheed and Lockheed said, well, what would it look like? So I, this is a model aircraft that I borrowed from a, from a travel agency shot with a, with a fisheye on my, on my uh, at that time Olympus. And, uh, and they liked it. So I flew out to California and I went up in a cherry picker and they, I, I made notes of where I wanted to mount the camera and they built a special housing to hold the cameras. And here we are mounting two cameras up on the top of this tail of vertical stabilizer for Lockheed uh, L-1011. One camera is on a, about a 30 degree angle so that when a camera was in the, when the plane was in a turn, it would be level. The other one was straight on for a, for a straight approach. One of them had 64 ectochrome, the other had 200 ectochrome and um, on both 500 exposure rolls, 250 exposure backs, I take that back, 250 exposure backs, which are really fragile. And uh, here I am mounting the cameras. The, um, I was, I, there were a lot of things I wasn't sure, but I thought maybe we might get hit, hit, we might hit a, an insect or a bug, or it might be turbulence. And uh, National Geographic built these housings for the cameras. Um, Lockheed built these, these, this big U-shaped yoke that went through the, tra the tail. And um, the um, I, I'm, I'm putting the, doing the final touches here, and I radio the pilot. And I said I had, I had cables running all the way to the cockpit with a left camera and a right camera cable, and um, I had tested all the cameras the night before in a hotel room. I had hooked them all up and tested the, all the wiring, the, the, the control box. Everything was perfect. So I hit my, just about now. I told the pilot click left camera, and he left left camera went click, and right camera went click 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 click. And I quit, I unplugged it. Holy smoke, what's going on? So I plugged everything back in and I said, try the right camera. And the right camera went click and the left camera went click, 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 click. And I said, stop, pull unplugged everything again. I said, holy smoke, what are we gonna do? So we had a, oh shoot, this is one of the pictures I didn't put back in, but we put a, I had a, a waste, uh, a, a, a backup plan. I, you could disconnect the wires at the tail of the plane. And I had an engineer sit in the tail of the plane on a milk cart. And I sat in the cockpit and I radioed to him, left camera, and he, and he had the little, like a little hand grip for the left camera and a little hand grip for the right camera. And he sat there for the whole flight. I would say left camera, right camera, left camera, right camera. And I no longer had an automatic counter. So I was using a, a pencil with a little marks to mark off the number of frames. This, this was um, over near Santa Catalina Island. And uh, one of my goal was to try to get into a situation where there are these heavy clouds and I wanted one of those wings dipping down into the cloud. And we had that until the day before the flight. That picture ran on the cover of the magazine. But the, the surprise and the totally unplanned serendipitous thing, now the, the serendipity is my, my pal. You know, I have never gone on an assignment or off to shoot a picture without something in mind, but that it really is not the picture that I want. The one I want is the, uh, is the unplanned picture, the planning for the unplanned picture. And this was another planned picture. This was a backup landing at um, Hollywood Burbank Airport. We had the, the plan for this camera was to try to do a, this, this, this was an idea for a planned picture. This was a planned landing picture. And it was originally supposed to take place at, uh, at, at uh, LA International Airport. And um, 
it is very difficult to get a permit to do a touch and go landing at the LA airport. They, you know, I, the, the pilots were able to do that. They, they then, uh, then you had to get into, you know, into, a land, into a landing, a pattern with the other aircraft to do that. And if you get in too early, even though it's, these night pictures are hard to get. If you get, if it's, if it's, usually I find that when it's darker than you think, it looks good. If, it's, if it looks good with your eyes, it's probably too light. We got, we got uh, radioed into the LA International way too early and um, the picture wasn't unusable. But this was a backup touch and go at LA at, at Hollywood Burbank. This picture could have been used. It would have been used. Um, the um, funny though, we, we, again, when we at LA International, when we were trying to get in landing formation with the other aircraft, uh, the uh, the tower kept radioing the pilots to to uh, beep beep them so they could find the, the our aircraft on the beeper. And the pilot kept saying, "Well, I'm beeping you. I'm beeping you." And the, and the tower kept saying, "Well, I don't see you. You're not showing up." <laughs> well, they said, "I know. I can see the you. I can see the all the other planes. I can get in. I get right in line." And uh, so we did. And uh, later, I learned that they, they knew there was no beeper. They had to remove all the transponding equipment when they put that bracket in for my for my cameras. <laughs> But this is the picture, the unplanned picture. See, this is landing after dark at Hollywood Burbank. And I initiated an exposure as we were approaching the airport. And so the, this is about a, I think we figured a 27 second exposure and the plane is coming in. And as, they, as the airport lights get closer, they, get, they start getting bigger. And then the plane, of course, is nose up. And when it touches, it derotates and it causes these lines to shoot up in the air. And, and, and we made this picture. And this ran as a three page fold out in the magazine. Another camera, very, very difficult picture. The, Bill Garrett, the editor at the time, um, wanted to make a statement for our 100th anniversary the, on the, um, our, our fragile planet. And the idea was to go take a, make a two-part hologram of this crystal ball blowing up, growing apart. And so I worked on it and uh, devised a a method of dropping a crystal ball. These are Stuben balls that cost a couple thousand dollars a piece. This whole episode for getting it printed cost several million, I think it was $5 million altogether in, in today's dollars. It was, it, it cost Bill Garrett his job. It, it was, a, it was, it, it was quite, uh, <laughs> quite an ordeal. So this is a device that's dropping this crystal ball through the air. For doing a hologram, uh, holograms, when they take place, uh, are usually done, done in, in sandboxes. And if a truck goes by two blocks away, it'll spoil it. So we're trying to photograph something that's being broken apart. And so we had, there's a one pulse laser in California that we're able to get a, a access to. And so we're in California. And I'm in the meantime, I'm making various tests of breaking globes with different kind of pellets and different kind of bulbs, try, looking at freezing it, looking at all different ways of sound, think, consider different considering different ways to break this, this globe. And in the end, we want to put, this is a target pellet gun. And, the, and the, um, this is the schematic of the setup, which I won't go into all the details. Like I said, this could take a half an hour just showing you how this was done. But it's a hologram and the, the actual laser is in another room. And the first, uh, the laser was so powerful though that if, if, you, if you didn't have goggles on, it could blind you. So yeah, there was another issue of setting everything up. And we had a, I had a special shutter made that, that, that got melted by the laser. And so then we had, we took the another shelter like that and we wound up putting it inside the laser in an area that could, before it was amplified. But anyways, the, 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 the scenario was uh, the globe was dropped and it, as it, after it's dropped, the timing, it, no, first of all, we lock on to the laser pulsing. The laser, by the way, you couldn't trigger it like a strobe. It had to be up and firing like 10 times a second. And so, we had to lock onto the timing so that the shutter would let one pulse in the room, but that pulse had to be determined by, by the, 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 the globe being dropped through the air. And of course, you don't want it just as an impact, it's got to continue to, to fall to the ground. And in the end, they had so much trouble printing it that they almost didn't use it. This was a backup picture they made, which I liked much better. This was breaking it apart in my basement at home. For um, 
you know, this is for another story on AV called Aviation. This was a story on the America's love affair with the car. I wanted to illustrate, uh, make a picture with a fisheye to make the make the Earth look like it's round, of course, and to make it look like it's almost covered with with uh, with interstates. And I found this one of the busiest interstates in the country in California. And I found a helicopter that would fly me. And I and because it's a fisheye, it's got to be underneath the helicopter down below. So I devised a, I made a rig that you would lower the helicopter, the camera below the helicopter. But it turns out that it was impossible to uh, get, it, you're not allowed to attach anything to a helicopter without FAA approval. And it has to be get, get the approval in the area where the flights will take place. And, they, and to get into their flight testing program, that, that program took, would take months and months. And we were at a real standstill. And when the pilot said, well, you're not allowed to attach anything to the helicopter, but there's no reason you can't climb out onto the skids while we're flying and just reach down underneath there and hold the camera. So that's what I did. I wore a safety harness and I climbed out on the skids and I held, held the camera underneath the, the helicopter and made this picture. This is a picture for the story on Panama. I wanted to do something a little different. This shows, this was taken before today's satellite pictures. It shows both oceans. The, the, uh, this is the Atlantic in the foreground, the Pacific in the background, and um, shows the, the Panama Canal. Taken with an Air Force, I brought an Air Force C-130, and to get the permission to do that, I had to get a high altitude card, which meant going to Texas and learning how to bail out of a plane and also undergoing high hypoxia or uh, getting into a pressurized cylinder where they make you pass out and so you know what it's like, what it's like to pass out. Anyways, uh, it was shot from the rear tail of a C-130, that's the kind of aircraft that you can drive a Jeep up into. And they lowered the ramp in the in, in flight and I walked to the end of the end shot looking straight down. And the person in the charge of the back is called the load master and he, uh, I wore a safety harness and had a big strap on me. They wanted me to wear a hillock, a mirror. They wanted me to wear both a parachute and the safety strap. And I nixed that. I didn't want to accidentally hit that parachute and open it up while I'm attached at the other end. So I said, no parachute. So I'm standing at the back with, no, with a parachute harness and the safety strap running back to the back of the, to the, to, to tied to the floor, I thought. And uh, made several passes. It was very bumpy. And, but I'm looking straight, standing right on the edge, looking straight down. And that and the old master came back and, uh, and um, to see what I was doing. And I'm thinking, boy, I hope this strap holds both of us. And I reached back and I grabbed it and I yanked it and it came loose. And he looked at me and we were both wearing oxygen masks. Our eyes were big, so big. And I backed away from the end and he apologized. He forgot to attach the other end. That was, this was a little, little episode I threw back in here I, from one of the lectures. I thought it was kind of interesting how scale can play such an important part to a picture. This is in the Soviet Union, or in this case, a little computer chip on a fingerprint. Computer chip on a fingerprint. I don't know if you can tell what that is. And this is kind of fun when I have audiences, I ask people to tell me what it is. And most people look at this and they see a steam engine, and they see, I'm sorry, take, they see, a, they see a, a ship in the bottom left corner. It, in reality, it is a steam engine. It was the Tanshan Mountains in China in the background, taken from the end of the Great Wall of China. That's a ship there. This is this little uh, island is called Just Room Enough Island on the St. Lawrence River. Taken from a, a road, uh, the terrain where I'm at is like the background, but there's a little road going straight up and I'm on that road, but I can't see when the ship is coming. So they solved that problem by having somebody with a walkie talkie sit on the island there and give me a countdown to a ship was coming. Scale. This is where this is where, for the Powell story. St. Lawrence River story. These guys are actually actually climbed up that ice wall on the left. But none of those pictures were as nice as this one here because you know the body language and everything about this was so so special. And, uh, and also one of those very, very scary days to think about because I walked out on a frozen part of the river to make this picture. And I'm standing there and I noticed the, sun, the snow around me kind of suddenly disappearing into a crack. And I thought, holy smokes. And I could hear water below me. 
And then I thought, God, you know, there was something cracked underneath this. And I started walking back and I had to decide myself, do I step on the same track was it before? And which is, or is it already compressed and it's gonna compress more? Do I make a new one? I don't remember that what, which one I did, but I do remember I being, being very nervous for that same story on, on time. I, I, I wanted to photograph our own timepiece, our heart. And I went to Dr. Leonard Bailey at Loma Linda in California. And he gave me permission for the first time to photograph a heart transplant. And I was on call for several weeks until he flew down to Texas to take a heart out of a child that was killed. And, um, and um, we, I, I jumped on a plane, I got a, a commercial flight in Washington, flew down to Texas, met him. And um, actually I had wor my experience at the t at working at Cleveland Clinic came in handy. I, the, I told the taxi to take me straight to emergency. I went inside and I said, I'm joining Dr. Dr. Bailey, how do I get there? And, um, and uh, I his room and they, they told me, and I said, where's this, where's the scrub room? And I went and put the scrub gear on my clothes on and I got there just as they took this heart out of this child. And we, they put it in the Tupperware container like this. We rushed back to this Learjet that was waiting and we flew back to Loma Linda. The next, they, they operated from about, I guess about four in the morning till about eight or nine, I guess nine, maybe noon on this little girl. She was only several weeks old. This is her at one year old, Krista. And here she is at 10 years old. There's a moral to this story. This was taken at uh, when they were on a ski trip to Tahoe. And um, I learned that a lot of my pic best pictures are often made in the first couple of frames of when you first come upon us something. So I made sure before I hiked up to their cabin in the snow that I wasn't on frame 33 or 34. And so I put a, I had a fresh roll of film in the camera. I had the camera set, I had a 105 lens in there, probably set for the ambient light or whatever it was, probably 250 to 2.8 it looks like. And I walked up there and I got to the cabin just as she got hit by the snowball. And I spent three days with them and none of the pictures were as good as this very first picture. This is her at 15 years old. Here she is at 20. And I'm due to photograph her again, again, COVID. This is another one. This is a picture that's an illustration, you know, planned picture for, to illustrate the waters in the Bahamas. Similar picture ran on the cover. It's nothing fancy. It's a just a camera over under uh, underwater camera that's half in and half out of the water. The water is pretty shallow, and so the, the light sand pick, we picked up the reflection onto the girl. For a story on uh, Florida treasure, this is Mel Fisher here coming out of the water with the uh, gold coins they found in a wreck of the Atoka. And uh, I went down to, to Florida to work on this story. And one of the pictures, th I call this the disappearing $50,000 coin. This picture, this the coin was the rarest of their entire collection. It's a, it's a, it was, it is an estimated value of $50,000 today. And uh, I wanted to photograph this coin. My, my thought was, well, we'll lay it in the sand and have the water, have some water, just run up on the, on, wash it on top of it and recede back. And so I went down with this, one of the organizers of the, the, this group and they took this coin and he had took with him a, 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 a broom to a sort of as a safety measure. And we went down and watched how far the water was washing up to the shore. And, and he, we laid the coin down and I had a tripod, I set it there. And, I waited and waited and waited. And he said, no, they gotta get closer. We're too far away. And I said, no, let's wait. And he said, no, we gotta get closer. So we went about 10 feet closer. In the meantime, these little kids were watching us. They were about eight years old. What are you doing, mister? What are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, go away, we're busy. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, we're taking pictures, go away. So they did, they had stopped, and they, but he stood back and watched us. Well, we were 10 foot closer. Then one of these rogue waves came in up to our knees and they're washing up the shore and then back and the recedes and the coin is gone nothing there. And the, my pal was rushing after it with a broom, stabbing at this receding wave, looking for it. And it's gone. And we're thinking, oh my God, what happened to it? And these little kids came up and said, are you looking for that thing you're photographing, mister? And we said, yeah. And they said, just go straight down. It'll be right there. And so we went down about four inches and there it was. 
you know, they must have been playing with their heavy toys in the water, and they knew that when the water, when the wave went over, that it doesn't float away; it just goes straight down. <laughs> Similar story with this: a rare. This was Grant's saddle, and then I got this little museum to loan me. And this is the saddle I learned is valued at three or four hundred thousand dollars today. I think it's insured. Actually, I think it said three to four hundred thousand dollars. It's in the Army Museum now. Grant's saddle is a saddle, and they they lent it to me. And I took it out and looked for a horse like Grant, the same color as Grant's. And I put it on this ivy fence and I walked back to my camera. And as I walked back to my camera, I heard this clippity clop, clippity clop, clippity clop. And I turned around as the horse grabbed the saddle by the horn and flung it out into the road, into the pasture. And I thought, holy smokes, I leaped over the fence and grabbed the saddle. <laughs> but I didn't give up. I, I'm actually about three feet out of this picture with a cable release on the long electric cable release and I put some corn on the on the field in the background for the horse uh, in the Philippines this is how this is how they move, move houses in the Philippines this is a, at a crucifixion in, also in the Philippines on Good Friday they nail guy they nail a guy to a cross but this they actually nailed him to the cross this year, it almost didn't happen. You can read here what happened. This was a newspaper article. They had no, they had, no one volunteered for the crucifixion. <laughs> but eventually they did get somebody. At the crucifixion, Gina Lola Brigida was taking pictures for Ferdinand Marcos. <laughs> and she was there and she got there too late. But I met her and she invited me to her house in Rome. This was taken to her home. This is a, a sculpture at her house in Rome that she made out of a, out of a Rolls Royce that she uh, totaled. In China, he's a, I was in a bus and I saw these kids running towards me and with these torches and I said, stop. And I jumped out and made, I think I made one frame as they ran by. You know, they were re recreating the route of the, of the Mao's long march. Also in China, this little village Chong, called Chongwei where these people heard a foreigner was coming and they stood in the rain for hours just to get a, get a glimpse of me. And wherever I walked in, in China, people would crowd around you like this here. They hadn't seen foreigners in 50 years. This is a Uyghur, one of the Uyghurs in the down northwest corner that are being so, no, that big your pardon, this man is not Uyghur. He's Chinese that was moved into the Uyghur area. I had some other pictures of Uyghurs that I do not have here but he's riding a, a family bike, a bike that is actually uh, built for families. Illegal to ride more than one at that time in the cities, but in the country, they allowed it. I was riding in a bus, made from an open window right behind the driver. And I had a little signal with the driver, the harder I squeezed on his neck, the slower he went. <laughs> Not really. We drove, after I shot this picture, we went ahead and I jumped out, I made quite a few other frames of him driving by, but but none were as good as this one. Thirty below zero logging train in China. Somebody called this a foul trick. It's this duck over here on the right, watching this chicken being cleaned. Taking a little bridge. Boat child in Hong Kong. Railroad factory in, in China. This picture almost didn't get made. The Chinese weren't, would not let me photograph this, this, this factory. I knew they were making steam engines here, but they absolutely refused. So I did a, I did a little counter espionage the night before. In our, my room, I told the writer I was with, Bill Graves, I said, I'm, I'm fed up. I'm going home tomorrow. I can't. I'm, the Chinese will not let me photograph things. They just are totally restricting us. You can get somebody else to come out here, but I'm going back. I don't know about you, but I'm going back tomorrow. The hell with it. And uh, the next morning, first thing at breakfast, oh, Mr. Dale, we have reconsidered. It'll be okay if you photograph the steam engine factory. <laughs> it got published. Some people in Iowa saw the picture published and they ordered one in the, one of the last engines ever made in this factory is now running out in, 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 is 
in the US, in the United States. I talked to the Chinese into giving me a room over uh, uh, on the, in, the, in the Peace Hotel, which was not open to foreigners at the time. And um, I wanted a room with a window because I wanted to make a picture of the traffic. And they made me promise not to photograph any military ships. And I said, okay. But I looked out the window one day and I saw this jam of boats and I opened the window and I made these pictures. And then I, then I realized right in the middle was a submarine. So I confessed to my whole handlers that, that I had photographed a submarine. And they said, well, can we see the picture before you publish it? And I showed it to them. And they said, well, that'll be OK. So it's obviously not one of their nuclear subs. In the Three Gorges, took a, this was a real fight to get this picture. Chinese said that didn't happen anymore. But these are, the, these are trackers that used to pull, pull the boats up the gorges. And I was in another boat. And I jumped out along the shore and walked back to them and rode with them for a while. The only thing, my only regret is that I didn't have a tape recorder. They had this mesmerizing chant that they were singing. It's my interpreter on the far right, Wenbin, making a note. This was a brand new hotel in Harbin. And that's the, supposed to be the reception desk. And I told Wenbin, that's, that's spelled wrong. That's the that's this deception. He said, yeah, it's the deception desk. He said, no, it's a reception, spelled wrong. It was carved out of brass. It was not an easy fix. This was taken in China in a, in a, in a courtroom. These are microphones in front of a judge. This is the only picture that I own in all of my years at the Geographic. I asked if I could own a picture for my 25th anniversary, anniversary at the Geographic. And it was special to me because it's a, it's a die minority group in China in the, in the you know, area called the Emerald of China, the north, southwest corner of China. Uh, and um, it was taken at dawn and it's foggy, but I had a, I had a little, uh, my Nikon at the time, I forgot what model that was. It had a pressure plate and the pressure plate had come loose. And so all of the film, all of the images in that roll were, were fuzzy, except this one here, which is soft in certain spots, like you, just like you had done it in a, in Photoshop. But that's it was a, it's a real picture. Serendipity plays a role again. So my father wanted a picture of one of my kids, and I I sent it to my printer and I took a frame of one of Christopher underwater and I sent it to the printer and I forgot to resize it. So it came out the size of a 35 millimeter frame. And I thought, oh darn, and I thought, gosh, it looks like a stamp. Huh, I wonder if I can make it into a stamp. And I made it into a postage stamp. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I could do the whole family like this. So I then did this whole family with the kids at the top, my three boys. And then they, as they get older, one, two, three, four, they, they get older. And I wasn't sure how to make a, a family tree at the top. So I, I downloaded a program on family trees and I started adding names to the trees. And I thought that was kind of cool. And now I have like, I think the last time I looked there were 3,400 names in that family tree going back about 20, 20 generations. But all that evolved, evolving out of that mistake in the print size. Another Fun story, not my pictures. Well, this one is. This is um, Farrell Eve. Farrell Eve was a, was a retired safety engineer that took my a workshop of mine in out in um, in in uh, Pecos, and uh, Pecos. He's got his, his his Nikon 950, I believe, and he fell in the fell in the Pecos River with this, and and he put he, he was just totally totally devastated, and so he. We put it in the oven, and then he drove with it tied to the windshield of his car for a few days, and they put a battery in, and they took a picture. And it came out like this. And he said, oh, no, it's screwed up. And I said, Harold, that's great. Take another one. So there was a white coffee cup on the counter. And he took this picture. And so and, and so Farrell uh, started taking pictures with this thing and getting these incredible pictures with this flooded cameras that we resurrected. And he started getting these incredible pictures. And so much, so I know a lot of professional photographers that have never published a book. But Farrell got a large advance to publish this book on his magic camera. Oh, this man I photographed, what's his name? Uh, Johnny Franks on the Yukon River in Alaska at 50 below zero. I flew in to, to, to visit him and uh, spent a couple of days with him. A, a little light plane left me off. The plane, when he stopped, he said he had 15 minutes to stay and otherwise he'd have to, have to wait till spring. So he, I stayed a couple of nights with him. This is at 50 below zero, those were, those were his cabins. Did a book on the American Southwest. Again, 
This is pick of it, Ben pick of it. It's a Piute medicine man that let me join him on some sweats and gave me a medicine, gave me a, an Indian name that's translated to hairy man from the East. Robert Geronimo, a grandson of Geronimo, who didn't often be photographed. He was working, uh, driving a, uh, road graders and I met him at Cow Camp number one in the Geronimo on the, on the Apache, on the reservation. And, and, uh, and I joined him for lunch and he asked him if he, if he minded if I took a picture or two and he said no. And, and I purposely had him sit there with the lighting was like this. And he was telling me that, that he didn't go to very many uh, tribal uh, events anymore because too many people said they wanted to fight with Geronimo and he was too often, too often obliged. Connie, Connie, uh, Connie, 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 what's her, Connie's last name? It was her property rights ceremony and uh, lasted seven days. I was one of the two white people invited, Joyce and I were invited to this. And this was a very special moment. She, she had just had, she had just been given uh, some pollen on her face and she was given her first taste of, of alcohol. And uh, it was just, at this point, it was Connie and I and her girlfriend. And uh, and the medicine man stepped out and Connie said to her girlfriend, she said, he had just given her some, some, some little taste of beer. And Connie said to her girlfriend, I hate that Budweiser crap. I don't know why we couldn't have Coors. <laughs> this is a cowboy with his, taking his daughter with him on the Saturday morning coffee break. She reminded me of one of those rubber squeeze dolls where you squeeze it and the air comes out the top. <laughs> Pecos, Texas. Car wash. Also in Pecos, Texas. Drive in beer, beer parlor. It's Edward Trujillo uh, sitting on the wall where that picture that he's holding was, what, where the picture he's holding was taken. Hmm, what, 75, 85 years earlier? That's his grandfather, who was a great friend of Billy the Kid. And Edward had all these stories about Billy the Kid. Edward's grandfather built that church in the background on Our Lady of Guadalupe. And Edward single-handedly maintained it. Cover of my gypsy book. I traveled with gypsies from England to India over, drove 13,000 miles over land. And um, here are some of the pictures. And now th these have become special to me now. I'm, I should have an exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts next year. And there was supposed to be an exhibition in Romania this year, which got canceled because of COVID. These are pictures from that. Most of these, this, this, this is in Pakistan. This was a, we drove across to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, places you, you could not do today. This group, we were camped and this village came out to just dance for us. This next little series, I think, is all Eastern Europe. So this is a gypsy caravan along a little water canal. It's a beautiful girl, isn't she? Father and son. In uh, Istanbul, in the alleys, I came across this, uh, well, I was with these gypsies with this dancing beer. And again, this is another shot that picture that you cannot take due to this is totally outlawed. Uh, but he had this dancing bear and he went into a house with a bear. And I said to my interpreter, where's he going? And, and the gypsy said, well, and by the way, I keep referring to them as gypsies. And politically, today you call them Roma, um, but they call themselves gypsies. So I don't feel like I'm offending them at all. So this gypsy says that he's, he's going in the house to, to, to see a woman on the second floor who has a bad back and the gypsy dances on her back to cure her. And I thought, holy smoke, could I take a picture of that? And so he asked her and they said, no. And I said, look, I'll pay for the next year of treatments. And the gypsy translated, no way, she's not letting me in her house. So I said, well, my back is bothering me. Do you think he could cure me or help my back? And so. The gypsy said, sure, lay down. And there was a woman um, that was listening and she's handed this little rug out through this barred window. And I lay down on the ground and this bear got up on my back and he sat down on my back and, and uh, everything was going fine until suddenly people started laughing and, 
And the lady in the window starts yelling at the gypsies. And I said, what's going on? And my interpreter said, well, the gypsy said it was a you know, 10 cents to have them walk on your back, but it'll cost a dollar to have them get off of your back. And the lady in the window was yelling, let him go, let him go, he's a foreigner. Uh, so I did go back to and retrace it back to, to, to this is a little town of Pesh in Hungary. And I've relocated several families, of several tribes that I photographed 50 years earlier. This was exactly 50 years ago that I was back. This was taken in 69, I went back in, in 2019. And so these are the Pesh ladies in 1969. I noticed this lady in the far right, you can see the resemblance. These are their, 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 their descendants today, 2019. This was such a marvelous visit. They absolutely, they treated me like royalty. I, I felt like a, I felt like a groom at a wedding party. This is me in, in 2019, no, 20, 1969, and then during our last, my last visit. So the same guys. And this little boy who I saw earlier, I've located him now. I, after a long search, we found him. And he lives in Budapest now. And he says that he has a large family and he, family, and he welcomes me back to Budapest again to do. In Mera, this is a little village I went to in Mera, Romania famous for the gypsy musicians. And I made, I had good luck there. I made quite a few very nice pictures. And, uh, and now Mera, this little sleepy little village, they have the World International Folk, Folk Music Festival here. And they're one of, they're, they're, they were planning an exhibition in my pictures this year. And the person that's organizing the festival has relocated about a dozen of the people in my early pictures. So that's again, after COVID. This is the Caldwell family, John and Lottie. They practically adopted me. And down here in Harlan County, Kentucky, this is Lottie going out to get pokeweed with her dog Rover. John, and it's at his forge. These people were rich if everything, if, if there was some kind of some catastrophe that went on, they, they were self-sufficient. I asked John what kind of bib overalls I should Bob buy, and he said, Oshkosh. And I said, why? And he said, well, they're the best. And I said, John, why are they the best? He said, well, they've got to be the best. That's what they wear on Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> That's John. John died a few years ago. I went back for, well, he went back, actually, it's more than a few years ago. It was 94, I believe he died. I went back to his funeral. He was buried on a hill that was so steep that they had to put a piece of wood in there to keep it from sliding down the hill. And I still keep in touch with them and recently got a message from their granddaughter that said, we're, we're having a get together on Father's Day and, and you're part of the family and you always will be and we hope you can make it. So that about concludes my talk. I don't know if we have time for any questions and only close this thing. In fact, I don't even know if anybody's here listening to me. Well, Bruce, I I, I personally like to thank you very much for your time. They're phenomenal pictures, and and um, I only got one question: Do you uh, you prefer shooting film or digital? Oh, well, you know, digital. Wow, I don't know how I made those pictures. That some of those pictures you saw there, the girl on that on that horse, then on, the, on that on that that merry-go-round, and some of the other ones. I went through all my pictures recently in the preparation to go back. I had one frame, one frame of these, one frame, because I was traveling and I had to carry all my film with me and it was precious. You know, I shot 219 rolls in almost uh, four or five months of traveling with these gypsies. That's not very much. I have a friend who does sports photography and photographed that, that same amount in one game recently. So uh, no, it is so easy now. It just, uh, I would have, I, I couldn't, I'd have a hard time going back. You know, we were shooting with film speeds of 25 and 50 and, uh, and they, were, they were not very forgiving. You know, the, the digital files today with the, 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 uh, uh, the you can be over and under and save them so easily. So it's a great latitude. So it would be hard to go back. The very last, you know, very last film picture I took was an underwater picture that I flooded the camera on the next day. 
How many cameras have you lost to water or phone? Rivers or whatever. Bigger pardon? How many cameras have you lost as far as like they fell in a river or down a canyon or? Uh, I actually have been pretty good with that. I had one, the, near, the immediate disaster that comes to mind was in the, that you saw that picture in the Three Gorges. Uh, it was October 10th because it was my birthday. <laughs> so I remember it clearly. And uh, I was shooting with two cameras and uh, I was, uh, as it got darker that day, uh, people were carrying things back and forth and I started using a slow shutter speed to get some movement. And the camera went zip, instead of going zip, zip. That doesn't sound right. I did a couple more, zip, and then I went to a, changed it to a 500th of a second, zip. And I had one camera that had, uh, that had a broken shutter, so I lost half of the film that day. So, so I, that was one of the reasons I would always try to use two cameras and alternate, so you didn't lose everything. And even when I shot pictures, I, 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 all of my film was numbered, one, two, one, two, three, four. All of the film was st stored separately, one odd number, even number. When I shipped my shipments back to Washington, they went back odd numbers and even numbers, kept the shipments apart so they're processed separately because there, there was always a chance you could lose a whole shipment. Either right. <laughs> but the camera, I only had one, cam one camera that some, I was photographing an Indian fire and uh, some Indians ra ran me down and grabbed my camera and smashed it in the ground. Um, not, uh, can't think of any others. Flooded camera. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. That's great. This was really, really wonderful, Bruce. Thank you so, so much. And you're, I don't know if you can see the chat is like um, fantastic stories. What a life. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Many memorable and funny stories of the images. Very entertaining. What a treat to see this and hear your stories. Thank you. So um, you're getting a lot of wonderful comments and um, certainly well-deserved. Thank you. And we did have uh, 55 people at one point. We're um, down to 45 at the moment, but <laughs> yes, everybody was still here. Good, good. It was very, Bruce, very interesting. I, I just remember Bruce growing up, uh, always watching, waiting for the National Geographic to come. And I remember one story I read about it somewhere that they used to actually test the film before they even gave it to the photographers. That's how distinctly uh, they were in those days. We we bought them in large batches. Yeah, we had a, we had we had the best photographic lab in the world. We really did. We would we would check the film and because even the the ISO is often changed. They they weren't something that would be might it might be marked uh, sixty four in the box, but it might be eighty, and so. We would test it and uh, carefully, and then we bought thousands of rolls at a time. Hey, Bruce, I have no. a question. Yeah. I have a memory of a photograph a long time ago in National Geographic. It was taken in England. And if my memory serves me correctly, there was kind of a big gold carriage traveling across in the foreground with a marvelous castle in the background. Do you have a memory of that? Might that no, have been but, yours? Um, no, it wasn't mine. I'm, I, I probably Bill uh, uh, Jim Stanfield did a lot of stuff on the uh, had access to the Queen and uh, did some stuff with the castle there. Probably. I'm okay. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Any hey, Bruce. Questions? I have a question for you. No. Yeah, Bruce. I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned that you were allowed to purchase one of your photographs for your, what, 25th? I was just kind of curious, like with all of this work that you have, like how does licensing end up working for you then too? Are you still able to say, hey, National Geographic, I want to publish a new book that features such and such work. Like how does that work with you? Or is this just all like National Geographic owns everything and, you know, you know, you're kind of left in the lurch. Technically, they own everything, yes. Um, however, we had an image collection that sold our pictures and they, they shared the profits with us, which were which was absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and regarding that other picture, uh, I did not buy that picture. I, they gave it to me for my anniversary. Um, and that was so, so Bill Allard, when, we, when I showed him that picture, he said, wow, you have, you've got, if you, if you stay for 75 years, you'll own enough for a triptych. Um, but uh, the, uh, the geographic, uh, they, they no longer, 
the geographic got by, got purchased by Fox by Fox and Fox sold it to Disney. Disney has disbanded our image collection. So recently, within the past few months, they have they've been very good. Uh, they have turned over digital files, all the digital files, three I've about three thousand of my pictures that I have that they've turned over to me, and I'm they're going into an, they'll go into a new agency where they can people. Or I, can, or I can sell them for, or I can do anything I want with them, basically. Technically, they can do anything you want with They can still use them. Disney can use them for anything they want. But um, I have sort of a co-authorship now in them, which is very nice. That's great. Thank you. Bruce, I was just wondering what cameras you used over your career. Well, I, I've, on the, when I worked on the Toledo Blade, I used Leicas mostly. Well, I've used a little bit of everything, you know, from Minolta reflexes to, well, I started with a four by five speed graphic, Minolta's, Leicas, I had Leicas. When I went to work, to work at the Geographic, they said you could have anything you want within reason plus two or three things that are not within reason. Well, I used uh, Leicas, so I got a set, a set of Leicas. Um, the um, Bud Wisher, who was in charge of the equipment, said, you take one of these Nikons, you'll like it. And, so he gave me a Nikon, and pretty soon I had Leicas and Nikons, and and then uh, and then uh, slowly it moved over to all Nikons, and then I had few, I've got a Cinar View camera, and I've used Hasselblads for specialized perk. They're they're like cameras, like a, like a tool, and it probably is the best camera for every single situation. But uh, you know I've had wide lux cameras, the panoramic cameras. And, uh, but there's only so much you can carry. And a lot of my early trips to China, I would have had 10 or 10 suitcases. That's crazy. The last trips to China, I only took what I could carry. And that was all I could, that, that was all that went with me. Um, so a little bit of everything. The last, I, I, I won a Sony uh, at, a, a, at a conference a few couple of years ago. And I was gonna sell it. And then I thought, well, he gave it to me. Maybe I should buy it. So I wanted to put in about four or $5,000 in lenses, more than that even. And, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, quite honestly, I should have stayed with, I wish I'd stayed with Nikon. Primarily because Nikon, I think they, well, they have a good camera. So Sony has some great features, but it, it has a menu that drives me crazy. Yeah, just, it's got at least 50 pages of menus and um, it's a good camera. But, but lately I've been using my iPhone, I got a new iPhone 13 Pro and I'm absolutely blown away. I went through my pictures from my first 10 years of National Geographic, and I could shoot 90% of them better with an iPhone, with today's iPhone, than I could with those you know, back then. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm still rock, still rocking the iPhone 7 myself. So right, that was I, I got. Well, that's what I got rid of. I had my i7 Plus, and but uh, <laughs> but the 13 Pro. Whoa, the things that it does just absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's including, tempting. Including this something called LIDAR, which makes these 3D scans of rooms and you can look at it in 3D. If you, if you happen to have one of these, try it. It's, it's magical. Oh, interesting. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, Bruce, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, looking online, I see Steve McCurry has Afghan Girl for sale. What, what's that all about? Afghan Girl for sale? Well, well maybe. He sells it. He sells prints, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys allowed to sell your work then? Well, as I was saying, yeah, the geographic is well. Steve was a freelancer, so it's a little different from. Okay. Um, although with Steve, I technically that was a cover picture, so the geographic was kind of stingy. They kept the co copyrights on the cover, but um, but they have given all the pictures back. I can sell anything I want now. Cool. But that's re that's recent. Before that, we had an image collection that sold for us, and they did they did really well for us, but no longer. Thanks. You're welcome. Great show. Thank you. Great presentation. Any more questions? Well, Bruce, again, I wish to thank you very much. A fantastic presentation. I think the story behind the picture from the photographer is fantastic. It adds a whole, personally, it's a whole other dimension to it. And uh, I do appreciate it. And as per your request, we will uh, download this. Uh, uh, someone will take a quick look at it and we will make sure you get a copy before we yeah. post it anyway. 
Yes, it would be interesting to see how many mistakes I've made. <laughs> well, anyway, well, thanks a lot and uh, enjoyed it. And, and um, enjoy the weather in Ohio. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Great. Have a wonderful holiday. Yeah, Thank everyone you. Have a great one. Okay. And I hope to see everyone next Monday, okay, with some of the prints and we'll just talk so. about it. No, no points will be given. Just a lot of, a lot of talk about photography and prints and talk with friends. It should be a great time. Have a good time, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Night. Over.